All right, so I got the recorder starting already, and we are going to get the class started. Okay, so last time we talked about the floating, the IEEE double precision floating point number format. In other words, you know, we talked about how the 64 bits are being used, um, and I showed you guys you know, the Wikipedia page on the floating point numbers, which is you know, the hyperlink that you see here. But you know, I also you know basically made my own explanation of you know what each bit is for and how we are going to um, compute the value being represented by those 64 bits. So this is a quick summary. Okay, it is about the same as what you saw in Wikipedia, just you know, kind of expressed in my way. <clears throat> so bit 63 is called the sign bit. And the way we use the sign bit, which is also called bit S in this notation, is if it is not false, then we multiply by a negative one. If it is false, uh, which is zero, we multiply by a one. So this part is basically the sign of the entire thing. Uh, C2 is the coefficient <clears throat> that would be going from bit 52 bit to bit 62. And... Uh, the exponent is this portion. So the exponent is E2. This is E without the 2, okay? So this E is um, doing a sigma notation uh, where I goes from 0 to 10. So there are 11 bits. And what we are doing is we are using bit 52 plus I times 2 to the power of I and do a summation where I goes from 0 to 10. That becomes an unsigned number, 11 bits. And what we do after that is we subtract the bias amount, which is 1,023, from E. That becomes E2, and E2 is the actual exponent that we use here for as the power of 2. So that becomes the magnitude portion of a floating point number. The rest of the bits from bit 0 to bit 51 these are the fractional part of the mantissa. So that's where C2 is. C2 is basically the coefficient. So C2 is computed by another sigma notation. This time I goes from negative 52 to negative one. But, you know, the, but then I change the way I index through you know, the bits of F. So the first bit that I use from F is I plus 52. And because I starts with negative 52, that means I start with F0 as a bit. And that is multiplied by 2 to the power of I, which means your bit 0 is multiplied by 2 to the power of negative 52. And then we just move I all the way up to negative 1. That's the fractional part. And then we add the fractional part to 1, that entire sum becomes C2, which is our coefficient. The coefficient is here. So we have the sign, we have the coefficient, we have a power of two, the product of those three things becomes the value of a IEEE double precision floating point number, you know, utilizing all 64 bits in the um, you know, eight bytes, basically. So are we good with this? I hope so, because we talked about this last Thursday. I gave, I gave you guys a concrete example, you know, of, I think, what was it, 23.375 or something like that, okay? Huh? 125, okay? So, you know, we used an example. I illustrated you know, how I verified the answer <clears throat> by casting the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer into the address of a double, and then dereference that particular address, um, and we got back the value. So that's kind of uh, what we talked about on Thursday in a nutshell. Are we doing okay so far? Yes? No? Okay. <clears throat> so when we talk about stuff like this, one thing you can do is to give yourself an exercise. In other words, you go like, hmm, I'm gonna do my own conversion, okay? I'm gonna pick a value, let's say, you know, 37.25, okay? 
go through the same process, come up with a bid pattern, and then use the same process, use GDB, to figure out you know, whether you got the right bid pattern or not. That would be something that you can do you know, by yourself. Um, you may encounter a problem if you choose a value that cannot be easily represented in binary. Um, for instance, 1.3 is not easy to represent. So you have to choose something that's easy to represent, which means it is a uh, summation of powers of two. That's basically what you need to use as an example. All right, <clears throat> so it would appear that we are basically done with this topic, and that would be too easy. So the rest of this is to talk about <clears throat> how do we convert from base 10 scientific notation to base 2 scientific notation, which is the double uh, precision format that we are talking about. The reason why I go through the rest of this module and also give you guys like you know, three additional activities to our homework assignments, I think we may be able to do start on one of them, is just so that you can work on the code and actually understand how the bits are you know, computed. Okay, how you how a double how a <clears throat> scientific notation in base two works. So that's kind of the the deal of the rest of this module is to kind of explain, okay, let's use the conversion process so that you understand you know, how scientific notation works, both in base 10 and also in base 2. And we'll go through the process of converting between base 2 and base 10. <clears throat> Do we have any questions at this point? I can only tell you when it's done. You're done when it's done. Um, so I will be working. I'm working on it. You know, I got everything scanned already. Um, I'm working on the program to generate the, the appropriate your know, keys, so I can when I'm grading it. You know, it would be very less, very unlikely for me to make mistakes. You know, when I evaluate your answer. The first question I got, you know, the answer already. You know, basically, I already know, you know, which two, you know, would come to the conclusion, or which three would come to the conclusion. The other ones, eh, I mean, I still have to work on that a little bit. <clears throat> but if you have specific concerns about exam one, you can always come to my office hour, and I can try my best to address your concern. All righty, getting back to this. All right, so the first thing, or one of the things I'm going to introduce here is also not so related to assembly language programming. This is called regular expression. This is how I can describe a properly formatted base 10 scientific notation. <clears throat> how many people know what I'm talking about when I said regular expression? So I got a few people, okay, very good. So this is something that's really quite useful. Regular expression allows you to specify a pattern and without using, a, without using code at all, okay? So you're basically using a notation to express what is the, the correct format of something. <clears throat> it is something that you will find useful when you are uh, working on any applications that require the parsing of text. For instance, I want to double check that the zip code is formatted correctly, or social security number is formatted you know, correctly, or phone number is formatted correctly. So it's good for checking that sort of thing. Uh, many of you will go through a, the four-year computer science program where you will take a class either called the Introduction to Automata or the Computational Theory class, where they will talk about Alan Turing's you know, Automata you know, the basic machines, the finite state machines, and so on and so forth. This is related to that, okay? So some exposure of this um, material can also help prime your mind for other classes that you will have to take at a four-year university. So let's go ahead and get started with this one. <clears throat> so the format, you know, is if you put anything in square brackets, it means, you know, oh, okay, so we are expecting something that can only be one of the things inside the square brackets. 
So what this part means, okay, at the very beginning of the entire thing, means you, know, you can explicitly express the sign of the entire value. A plus obviously means it is not negative, and then the minus sign means it is negative, okay? So that's uh, what the square bracket plus minus means. And then when you have a backslash equal to, it means whatever is immediately before the backslash equal to can is optional. That's basically, it means it's optional, which basically means you can have zero or one occurrence of whatever is immediately before the backslash equal to. So in this case, because the, the one thing that is before the backslash equal to is the plus minus, in square bracket, so this entire thing means the sign, the explicit sign of the value is optional. It doesn't have to be there. If it is not there, it means the default sign is positive, but if you want to be explicit about, you know, it's a positive value, you can put a positive sign, it's not a syntactical problem. If you want to express a negative value, then you definitely need a negative value or negative sign right before the rest of the number. Okay, so moving on, <clears throat> we have uh, in square bracket 1-9. So this expresses that this is specifying one single character. It can be one, two, three, four, all the way up to nine. So the dash allows you to specify a range where you specify the lower um, end of the range, dash, and then the higher end of the range. So in this case, instead of me having to write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I can write 1 dash 9, but you notice that 0 is not allowed, okay? Because 0 as a beginning point of the mantissa is not normalized, okay? So I'm just excluding 0 as the first digit. And then after that, we have backslash open a paren, and it is, this is the uh, matching close uh, paren here. So backslash open and backslash close paren defines what we call a group, okay? In other words, we can now say, okay, this is a bunch of characters, but we can treat this bunch of characters as one thing. So whatever is inside the, the backslash open and backslash close paren would be this portion here. And let's take a look at this portion and see what that means. The first part is backslash dot, which basically is just the dot on your keyboard, but it has to be escaped. Because in regular expression, a single dot means I can match any character. But in this case, I don't want it to match any character. I want this to match exactly just the decimal point symbol on the keyboard. Yep. Oh, kind of like your backslash N in C and C++. So backslash dot is not exactly the dot, is, okay. Because dot by itself already has a meaning, which is not what we want in this case. If I want just the dot by itself, I need to escape first, so that it becomes really just the dot itself. It's, a it's not a modifier, it is an escape. An escape is an escape, it's not a modifier. <clears throat> it has to do with, you know, okay, in C and C++, okay, if you just type N in a quoted string, N is just N, right? N is just, you know, the letter N. So if you want the line feed character, then you need to put a backslash before the N to mean, oh, I don't want the letter N, I want the line feed character itself. In this case, it's actually the opposite because the dot by itself has a meaning, which is not what I need in this case. So I have to do escape here to say, no, I don't want the normal meaning of a single dot. I want just literally the decimal point or just the period that you type on the keyboard. Is that okay? Sort of, okay. So this has to be here, okay? And we need exactly one occurrence of that. Backslash and D on the other hand specifies any digit, which means it's from zero to nine. In other words, instead of typing backslash D, I could have just used the square bracket notation and specified zero to nine in, in place of the backslash D. But backslash D saves me a few keystrokes, 
So backslash D, it is. It is a digit. <clears throat> there is an asterisk after the backslash D, this one thing here. It does not mean asterisk itself. It has a special meaning. This one specifies I can have any number of the thing that is right before the asterisk. So in this case, what is right before the back, what right before the asterisk is backslash D. This means I can have any number of digits after the decimal point. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. <clears throat> so now I have ex just explained the entire group, which basically means in addition to a single digit, you can now follow, you can use a dot blah, blah, blah to follow the, the, the single digit, but this portion has to start with a period followed by any number of digits. This entire group is quantified by backslash equal to, which means it is optional. In other words, this entire group here can have zero or one occurrence. So if you want to specify the mantissa as just two, that's perfectly okay. If you want three, that's perfectly okay. If you want to say three point without any additional digits after the point, that's okay too. If you want to specify 3.14, that's also okay. Are we still doing okay so far with you know, what this notation is trying to express? Okay. And then we have another backslash equal to, uh, excuse me, backslash open paren, <clears throat> which is matched by the backslash close paren here which means we have another group. Within this group, the first thing you have to specify is a lowercase e. So that means, you know, okay, if you want this portion, then the e, the lowercase e has to be the first thing within this particular group. Once again, we have an optional sign, okay? Because square bracket, you know, plus minus means, you know, that spot can be a plus or a minus, but then the entire thing is optional because of the backslash equal to. <clears throat> After the backslash equal to, we have a backslash D, which is any digit from zero to nine. But then this time we have a quantifier of backslash plus, which is similar to the asterisk symbol. The asterisk symbol is saying we can have any number of occurrences of the thing right before, which includes zero. Backslash plus says we have to have, we have, to have at least one of whatever is right before, but then you can have one, two, five, 10, 16, whatever. <clears throat> In other words, backslash asterisk, excuse me, just asterisk itself is any number of, backslash plus means at least one of whatever is immediately before that. <clears throat> All right, so this entire group here allows you to specify the exponent, but this entire group itself is also optional, so that means if you want to just type 3.14, that's syntactically fine, not a problem. If you want to type, you know, 3e, I think it was 8, okay, you know, because that's the speed of light in uh, meters per second, that's fine too. Are we doing okay so far with this description? Yes. So yes. In other words, one by itself is meeting all the standard already. Yep. But you can also make it as complex as negative 1.23 e minus 4.5. Okay, go ahead. Continue. Um, so the idea of using a suffix instead of a prefix is a good thing because, you know, when you use suffixes, you don't need to use, um, container symbols as much. Yep. <clears throat> and go ahead. I'm not sure what you mean by that. So if, you, if you're on Mozilla, right? Yeah. So you uh, control pass, you put this pattern in, you write slash 
because this is a VI, you know, regular expression. Okay, so let me show you guys how to test this pattern. For those of you who are interested in both VI and also your know, regular expression, give me a second. Uh, that is. No, the question is, what kind of rejects is it recon recognizing? There are several different types of you know, uh, rejects. This is the VI re uh, rejects. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys. Give me a second. <clears throat> All right, so I'm in VI right now. And let me put in something that's legit, okay, and it's kind of complex. So let's say it's plus 1.23E minus 4.5, okay? So this is legitimate, okay? How do we know? Because um, the initial sign you know, can be a plus or a minus, okay? It's optional, but we can have one. And then we have a single one, okay, matching this part here, a single dot matching this part here, and then after the dot, I have a two, three matching this part over here. After that, I have a single letter of E matching this part here, and then a minus matching this part over here, and then I have a four or five, matching your backslash d backslash plus so this is matching the entire you know uh, description so <clears throat> now the question is is the uh, regular expression actually recognizing this so what i'm going to do next is to do a search so in vi if you type slash it starts a regular expression search so now i can specify exactly what i have okay and the nice thing about um, VI is, you know, when you do a match, it will show you what is matching right away by highlighting, you know, the text. So you can see that, oh, okay, it's matching the plus, it's also matching the minus. It doesn't quite see the entire thing as one entire thing. But that's okay, because I'm not done with typing in the entire um, regular expression yet. So I'm going to type the rest of the regular expression, backslash equal to, okay. So now it is taking the entire thing, which I think is not the right thing to do. Okay, zero to nine, uh, one to nine, and then backslash open, backslash close. This is the way I type you know, so, so that I don't forget to um, close something when there's an open, backslash dot, backslash D asterisk. And then outside of this, we have backslash equal to, which basically means the two, three portion is optional, but you can, we can have um, zero or one occurrence. And then we have backslash open, backslash close, backslash equal to, go back here with an E, and then we have um, bracket um, plus minus, close bracket. And then we have backslash equal to, which means the sign itself is optional. And then we have backslash D, backslash plus. And now you can see the entire thing is in white, which means it is recognizing the entire pattern as one single thing using the regular expression that we just talked about. Yep. <clears throat> Say that one more time. Nope, that would not be okay. So let's 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 try that. Two hundred point is not okay because we are only allowed to have one single digit on the left hand side of the decimal point. Hmm? That would not be okay either because there's only supposed to be one single point. Oh, digit two and a point. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, because the <clears throat> because the point is necessary here for this optional part, but within the optional part, the digits you know is entirely optional. You can have zero occurrence of the digits after the point itself. So this is really kind of interesting because you can actually type something on the go, and you go like, okay, what if I have an e, but I don't specify any digits? It doesn't recognize it. Right? So you have to have le at least one digit to, for it to be recognized. Is that okay? All right. So to answer your original question, it depends on which variation, which variant of regular expression we are talking about. 
Um, this is the VI regular expression. Um, when you use, um, I think grep has a slightly different um, syntax. So there are a few floating around. You know, some are extended and some are more elementary. All right. So don't don't you know, worry about you know, me asking you about regular expression questions in any exam. I will not do that. This is just an exposure because I think hmm, it's kind of good to throw that in at this point because you know originally I wanted the class to write your own parser to parse a base 10 scientific notation and then later on I decided eh, okay maybe that's not a great idea so I wrote the parser and you only have to do the conversion from base 10 scientific notation to base 2 scientific notation otherwise known as a floating point number all right any questions comments or otherwise discussion about regular expressions okay you will find it quite useful especially for people who work with um, you know text retrieval um, it doesn't even have to be for syntax you know detection or syntax error detection uh, or validation okay you, because you can extract portions of a text for you know from a text document using regular expressions it's actually really quite useful we can you can use it for to do to do a lot of things <clears throat> all right so with that all said we are going to move on to talk about you know um eh, there's a little exercise you know to ask you to write a parser but I think most people do not want to do it, even though you should be able to do that, okay? Because once you have taken CISP 360, if I give you a string that is a properly formatted, you know, um, base 10 scientific notation, as described earlier, you should be able to write a parser to extract all the various parts of the base 10 scientific notation. But we are not gonna do that. So what we'll do next is to convert talk about the conversion from a base 10 scientific notation to the double precision floating point number format. All right. So the entire thing is about converting everything from this part to this part here. You can see the sign doesn't change, okay? The sign is the easy one, okay? If it's negative, it stays negative. If it's non-negative, it stays non-negative. But the coefficient is originally a base 10 coefficient, and that needs to be changed to a base 2 coefficient. The magnitude was originally a power of 10, and it needs to be changed to a power of 2. And I need this equality to be as close as possible. It's not always possible to be, it's not always possible to be exact, but I need that to be as close as possible. All right, so this is what we're going to do, okay? This is the objective of what we are trying to accomplish. I will give you a base 10 scientific notation, so you will have this part, you will also have that part. What I want your program to return is something that is that has the C2 and the E2, basically turning it into a base 2 scientific notation. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, so the error is not even visible. So when you print it out, it would usually do the rounding. So there are certain values that you cannot represent, like 2.3. Okay, sounds pretty easy, right? 2.3 in base 10 is really easy to represent, but it cannot be represented exactly in base 2 in a double. But when you ask your program in C++ to print a double value of 2.3, it will print exactly just 2.3, even though the actual value being represented is not exactly 2.3. It's off by just a little bit, but it's not exact. All right. <clears throat> All right, so section 5.1 you know, talks about, so we want to do this with only using integer math. In other words, we are not going to use log. We are not going to use natural log or log 10. We're not going to use... Um, uh, the power function, okay, we are, so we are, we are not going to use double numbers at all. 
we're only going to, going to use integers in the entire process. So can anyone guess why I'm so concerned about the use of the double type? Why do I want to restrict the program to only make use of integer math? So we can use integer addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, comparison, and so on, but I don't want to touch anything that is either a float or a double. Yes? Not, I think you're on the right track so that I can do it with a um, simpler processor that has no hardware support for doing double or floating point numbers. So this way, you know, you can have a, you know, you can, you can put that subroutine onto a Fitbit, okay, and it will still fit. It will still be able to work because it doesn't need all the floating point units, which makes the device more expensive and the battery drains faster as well when you have a floating point unit. So are we doing okay so far? Does everybody understand what I just said? Okay, I think a picture is probably better to, uh, to, to illustrate what I mean. So if you go onto the internet and you search for the CPU die, okay, processor die, uh, to compare the integer versus the floating point unit, <clears throat> you will see that how much space is being used by the floating point, num uh, floating point units. Um, uh, let's pick the Pentium processor. Okay, let's see if this will work. Okay, so I'm gonna take a picture here. Okay, so let's take a look at you know, all of these things. We're not gonna go through the entire thing. Um, we'll look at the, all the major components. The floating point unit is the green portion. So the green portion is capable of doing sine, cosine, tangent, power, log, natural log, base 10 log, and so on and so forth. Multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Everything that, can, that you do with floating point numbers, you know, double or float, is gonna be the green portion. And the integer math portion is Right here, the integer ALU, which stands for arithmetic and logic unit. You can see the size, right? This is pretty big compared to the yellow portion here, which is responsible for doing integer math. Does that make sense to you? So even if you're not using it, um, just powering up the processor, it's going to take some power for you know, the floating point unit as well. The, and the processor is more expensive because most of the time, okay, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether you guys know about uh, semiconductor fabrication. So you can basically, you are printing, okay, literally printing the pattern on a wafer. The wafer, the current wafer size is about 30 centimeters, so, or 300 millimeters. So imagine a 30, 300 millimeter um, diameter a disk, okay, that's made out of silicon semiconductor material. They print the circuitry on top and then they go through the etching process and so on and so forth, so they have the circuit. Um, how many actual chips would fit onto a wafer like that? Depends on the size of the processor. So if you want to include the floating point unit, the die size increases which means you, know, you cannot have as many processors per wafer compared to a simpler processor that doesn't have the FPU or the floating point unit. Does that make sense? Okay, so, and then there's one more thing. The circuitry involved in floating point unit, you know, floating point calculation is also very complex. So that means you know, there's, a, there's a good chance there's a defect somewhere within the green portion and then your chip is useless. So that means you know, the yield of how many processor use, how many usable processors you can get out of a wafer is also impacted because of the inclusion of the FPU. So if you don't have to include the FPU, you don't, it, there's, you know, there, there are economical reasons to basically say, if you don't need the FPU, leave it out. You know, we can lower the cost of the chip we can also lower the energy requirement for the processor, so you have more battery life and so on and so forth. So this is why 
<clears throat> in the module that we are talking about, I refrain from the use of any floating point number operations. So even though we are converting to the double format in this process, I am not using, I'm not assuming that the FPU is around to help me. Yes? So everything that you want to do with floating point numbers can either be done by software and combined with integer arithmetic only, or you can have the FPU to do it in hardware. Now, if you have the FPU to do it in hardware, it's a lot faster. But you're sacrificing you know, the cost you know, in terms of the chip as well as battery life. So there's a trade-off you know, between do you want to do, in, do it in hardware or do you want to do it in software? If you do it in software, it's extremely slow, uh, but you can do it. Huh? We have already, you know, we have already learned how, everything that we know that we need in integer arithmetic, because we talked about what addition, we talked about subtraction. That's all we need. <laughs> everything else is built upon addition and subtraction. And also, okay, I, I lied, because we also need bit shifting and stuff like that, but those are easy stuff, okay? You know, com by comparison, shifting a bit, you know, either to the right or to the left, is pretty easy to do. All right, so are we good so far, you know, in terms of, you know, why we do not want to use any double precision floating point number operations in this entire process, okay? All right. <clears throat> oh, by the way, this has something to do with um, NVIDIA and AI. So what's going on with NVIDIA in relation with uh, uh, generative AI these days? Hmm? Yep. And what is the current valuation of NVIDIA? How much is the company worth now? Yep, it is exceeding a trillion dollars. Just imagine that, okay? You, you look at Elon Musk and go like, he's a rich man, but he, he cannot buy NVIDIA. NVIDIA is, is, is worth more than a trillion dollars. And what is driving the, the valuation of NVIDIA all the way up to more than a trillion dollars? Well, NVIDIA is a semiconductor company, so we know that. But what is the reason? I mean, semiconductor has been around for a long time. Yep, yep, because we are, <clears throat> we are running out of processing power because with all the generative AI applications, everything from ChatGPT to Sora, you know, to all the other you know, AI applications, we are running out of resources. There is not enough hardware in the entire world to meet all the demands of AI stuff. So NVIDIA, so what is, why is NVIDIA, uh, why NVIDIA and not Intel or AMD? Hmm? Everybody wants to make more money. Intel wants to make more money too. They have better graphics card, and graphics cards have what? Okay, a very specific kind of processor. What is it? Okay, okay, so how do you numerically evaluate you know, differential equations? CUDA core. CUDA core, which is a, a form of a GPU, a graphic processing unit, a GPU. So how many GPU is on a high-end graphics card? Come on, you, I know many of you are gamers. This is where you're gonna shine, huh? I, I don't know, I'm not a gamer. <laughs> I really am not. <clears throat> the kind of game that I play would, do not benefit from GPUs at all. So let's look it up, okay? So let's look up the NVIDIA flagship um, graphics card. Or 
Okay, I don't even know whether this is the uh, the flagship, but looks like it is. Okay, so let's look at the spec. Um, so the RTX 3090 Ti looks like that. It really is the flagship. It has 1,752 CUDA cores. Each core is a quote unquote GPU. Sorry? 10,000, right? Okay, sorry. So 10,752 individual core on a single GPU, I mean graphics card. So NVIDIA has been in this business for a long time. So they designed these CUDA core to be energy efficient, to be efficient in terms of how silicon is used, and so on. So typically in the graphics card, you're gonna use these for ray tracing and doing all kinds of sine, cosine calculation. But the same kind of architecture is also useful for neural network training. So that is why, you know, if you want to train your own LLM, okay, if you have a high-end graphics card, you can get the job done a lot faster. And I mean really a lot faster compared to huh? Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna end up with a heater. Yeah. That heats up not just one room. You know, you have to circulate that hot air throughout the entire house. <clears throat> hmm? Yeah. <laughs> But, but that is why NVIDIA is picking up business and not Intel and not AMD, because NVIDIA has been around doing this type of chips for a long time. In other words, right now, the bottleneck is not the software. It is not how we do the training. It's not about neural nets. It is now about we don't have enough hardware to do all the computation. Um, you still need people to fab it. I don't think they have the same capacity as. Um, well, Nvidia may be using them for manufacturing, but you're still buying from Nvidia because Nvidia is the license is licensing the design to be fabricated in Taiwan. But you know, once it's done, you're still buying from Nvidia. It's just like, you know, iPhones, right? You know, iPhones are made in China. So how come you don't go to China, go to Xinjin, and then just get a few cell phones for a whole lot less, less expensive than it is here in the Apple store? Because you cannot. Oh, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, it's not exactly legal, right? <clears throat> All right, so we have digressed quite a bit here, but this is all relevant because how many people here are pursuing a degree in computer science as opposed to computer engineering? Computer engineering are the people who design the CUDA cores. Computer science people are the ones you know, who are writing the software or coming up with the theoretical stuff to make use of the hardware. So right now, the, thresh, the, the bottleneck, okay, at least the perceived bottleneck, is hardware. So I think that that's kind of interesting because I know uh, computer science you know, of a lot of UCs do not have um, tag. They don't, they don't tag because you know, they are saying, hey, we, I got enough people competing to get into my program. I'm not going to do tag. I'm going to look at the pool of applicants and then choose the best applicants to let them into my program. I don't need to tag anyone. Computer engineering, on the other hand, has a lot of tag because you know, they're not as popular as computer science. But at the end of the day, at least right now, <laughs> we are, the bottleneck is hardware, not software. So I just, I just hope that you guys are understanding you know, where the bottleneck is and in terms of you know, your careers you know, plan and so on and so forth. Do you guys understand what I'm talking about? Okay. So even if you want to continue with your computer science degree, <clears throat> I think it doesn't hurt to understand a little bit more on the other side 
which is how things are done in hardware. And that's what this class is about. No, we are not designing CUDA cores in this class. However, we are talking about what? Adders, subtractors, and then later on we'll talk about the processor, how instructions execute, and so on. So even though we are not designing CUDA cores or anything that's high performance, this is the fundamental stuff that you have to understand in order to continue to understand how to do the more you know, high-end stuff later on. All right, so getting back to this whole discussion here. Question? Okay. All right, so what we'll do is we are looking at a specific example. Okay. So in this case, we want to express your know, 2.67, which is also known as your know, 267 times 10 to the power of negative 2. So in this case, 2.67 is what someone would type on the keyboard and say, this is the value that I want to represent, is 2.67. However, if I don't want to use double or float as a type, how am I supposed to represent you know, the value of 2.67? Well, okay, it's not too hard because what I'm gonna do is I would use the C10, which is the coefficient in base 10, to represent exactly 267. But then I'm going to, I'm going to use negative two to express the exponent of 10, so that in the end, I'm still representing the same value of 2.67. It's just that it's not, it doesn't look like 2.67. Okay? Okay, so let me <clears throat> use my tablet to explain this, okay? Because I think some people may not be fully understanding what I mean by that, because I need everything to be in integer type, okay, in the program. So let me switch to the tablet, which is here, okay. So what I'm saying is, okay, okay it's still working. All right, so I, what I'm saying is 2.67, which is the value that we want to represent, can be represented as 267, which is now an integer, because I want to convert everything into integer, times 10 to the power of negative two. Negative two is an integer two. I can represent negative two just fine. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what I mean when I said, okay, I don't want to use decimal points. I don't want to use anything that is a float or a double, but yet I still want to be able to represent a value like 2.67. So we good here? All right, cool. <clears throat> and now we switch back to this. All right, so when we do the conversion, ultimately what we are doing is we're trying to get rid of the exponent of 10. I will give you an example, okay? So let's just say that we are looking into representing uh, 2, 24, 10 to the power of 56, okay? That's a huge value. And some, so in this case, okay, this is now, you know, this is V. V is you know, originally expressed like this. So the first thing I want to do is look at this and go like, I don't want to deal with 2.34. Oops, uh, okay. So I can now say this is the same thing as 234 times 10 to the power of what? This is, hmm? 54, that is correct, okay, so. So the, the parts that I need to represent would be the coefficient and also the power of 10 in this case. Those are the things that I need to represent. The 10, eh, not so much here, because as long as I know the 54 is a power of 10, it's not a problem. Is that okay so far? Okay. So I want to do some conversion here so that eventually this is going to become some kind of C2 times two to the power of something, I'll call this E2 over here. That's what I want to do. I want to somehow do all this conversion into something like this. 
So the, quick, the, the question is, what is the process of doing that? Now, this, this process happens every single time when you use C in in C++, and you're reading some number from the keyboard into a double. It's just that the C library or the C++ library is doing this for you so that you don't have, you're not aware of it, okay? So let me just add one more thing, okay? I'm just gonna say this is the same thing times you know, two to the power of zero. Is that okay with you? What is two to the power of zero? It's just one, okay? So it looks like you know, we are not doing anything useful with the two to the power of zero, but I need to track the power of two along the entire process. So the question is, what exactly is the process as we work on something like this? So, so does everybody understand the objective? what we are starting with, and what we, what we want to end up with. The other thing you, you can also imagine is, okay, so maybe we can just look at you know, what we end up with is to have a 10 to the power of zero. So we are basically changing the power of 10 from 54 down to zero, but in the process of doing this, we also may end up with you know, changing the power of two from zero to some e2 over here, and then the coefficient, which is shared between 10 and two, is also going to change in the process. Are we doing okay so far with what we want to accomplish? Not so much you know, how we're gonna do it, but you know, how we can accomplish this, okay? So if I go back to the notes, okay, Section 5.2 has a few sections, but the most important part is we, we're gonna have to deal with division, and we are going to have to deal with integer division, which is inexpensive, okay? You know, in, even though you can do division using software, but the hardware divider in integer is not really that expensive, so we don't have a problem with using integer division in most cases. All right, so. I'm just trying to think of how to present this topic here. Okay, I think I'm, I'm just going to talk about this you know, sequentially so that we don't miss anything important. All right, so consider an integer division of n divided by d. n is the numerator, d is the denominator, hence the name you know, n and d. Because it's an integer division, the quotient is only the integer, in, the integer or integral part of the actual result which means there's a truncation error. Okay, let's talk about the truncation error. So, okay. So let's talk about a very specific you know, division. So we are looking at, let's say, 14 divided by 10, okay? So 14 divided by 10, you guys go like, oh, and we know what it is, it's 1.4. Well, yes, it is 1.4, but if, you, if this is an integer division, what is the result of 14 divided by 10? It's just one, okay? So that means you know, when you're using an integer, integer division, you are basically taking the floor after the division, and it is just one. What is the error in this case? In other words, if you compare the actual result of 14 divided by 10, and you say, but we are getting the floor of 14 divided by 10, and then you divide the entire thing by what you're supposed to be getting, which is 14 divided by 10, this gives you the rate of error, okay? Which is the difference between what you're supposed to get and what you're getting divided by the value of what you're supposed to be getting, okay? So we, I think we can figure this out, right? You know, because you know, 14 divided by 10 is 1.4, and the floor of 14 divided by 10 is just 1. So we are looking at 1.4 minus 1, and then the whole thing divided by 1.4. So that is 0.4 divided by 1.4. So is this error rate small or big? It is pretty big, okay? Because we are looking at, what? Just give it an estimate. 
30% ish. Okay, that's not bad. That's no, no, I take it back. <laughs> it is bad. Okay, it is not good. This is not good. This is really bad. So you go like, huh? So how can we reduce the error? So let's go ahead and multiply, you know, the numerator by 16. Okay. So now we have 14 multiplied by 16, the whole thing divided by 10, minus the floor of 14 multiplied by 16, the whole thing divided by 10, divided by 14 times 16, the whole thing divided by 10. Obviously, the division by 10 is not going to be very useful here. So I really don't know the result. So we'll go ahead and do some computation. So let me switch to the command line here. You guys are already thinking, you know, can you really do math on the command line? The answer is yes. It is actually not too bad. Mm, Q. Okay, so we have quit it here. Uh, scale is, eh, we'll just use 7 as a scale. So we are looking at <clears throat> 14 times 16 divided by 10 minus the floor of that which I don't know how to express. Let's find out what this is. Okay, oh, okay, that's easy. So that's 22.4 minus 22. And then we, this is our error. And then we want to divide the error itself by the value that we're supposed to be getting, which is 22.4. So now the error is 1.7871%. Uh, I think that's significantly better. Right, so what this is showing us is if you make the, the not, if you make the numerator as large as you can before you do the division, the error rate drops. Is that okay? So you go like, but I don't see how this is going to be applicable. Well, we'll see it later. All right. The second thing we want to you know talk about is the bias of error. In other words. If you look at these two examples, even though the, the magnitude of the error is different, what about the sign of the error? They're all going to be positive, right? Because when you take the floor of something, that value is always going to be less than whatever you're taking the floor of, or the same in some cases. In, very rare, in, in really rare cases, they are the same because you, know, you, you don't have any fractional part. So that means every time I apply an operation like this, I will end up with an error that is always in one particular direction. So if I repeat this operation many, many times, those errors will all err in on the same side and they all accumulate, which is not good, okay? You don't want to have errors with the same bias all the time. So that means we need to do rounding, okay? Because you know, taking the floor of something is not rounding, the error is always gonna be the same. Okay, so let's talk about rounding for a little bit. All right, so what do you know about rounding? What is the round of 0.5? Hmm? It's 1, okay, very good. And then the round of 1.2 is 1, okay. So we know that you know, if the fractional part is 5 or more, we round up. If it is less than 5, less than 0.5, then we round down. Is that okay? But round is a floating point function. And we don't want to use it. So the question is, how can we do rounding when you have a division? We want to round the result after an integer division, but without using round as a function. Yes? Hmm? Well, if you use the ternary operator, you still need to compare floating point numbers. You still need to represent floating point numbers somewhere, which is also something that we want to avoid, okay? So we want to figure out how we can do rounding without actually using floating point numbers, without using uh, floating point functions whatsoever, okay? So let's just say that we are doing, you know, 16 divided by 10, <clears throat> and we want to do the round of this, okay? So can someone tell me what that is supposed to be? What is the round of 16 divided by 10? It's supposed to be 2. Very good. And what is the round of 32 divided by 10? 
that's just three because you know the fractional part is only 0.2, which is less than 0.5. Okay. So I'm going to give you a magical thing that can fix this problem. So if, when we want to do a round of x divided by y, assuming y is a multiple of 2, okay? 10 is a multiple of 2, 2 is a multiple of 2, okay? So the two bases that we normally have to deal with are multiples of 2. This turns out to be the same as the floor of x divided by y plus 0.5. Okay. You go like, wait, Tech, did you just convert it rounding to floor? The answer is yes, okay? So now you want to check this and see if it works. So is two really the same thing as 16 divided by 10, take the floor of that, oops, let me take it back. <clears throat> okay, plus 0.5 and then take the floor. Does that work for you? 16 divided by 10 is 1.6. 1.6 plus 0.5 is 2.1. The floor of 2.1 is indeed a 2. Okay, seems to work out. What about the 32 divided by 10? Well, we can check it out too. So we now have 32 divided by 10 plus a 0.5. What exactly is that? Well, 32 divided by 10 is 3.2. 3.2 plus 0.5 is 3.7. The floor of 3.7 is ah, indeed 3. Okay, but we still have a problem because, hey, tech, we are not supposed to use floating point numbers. The 0.5 is not supposed to be here. Well, that's easy to get rid of because you can use algebra. Because I said earlier that y is a multiple of 2, so that means y divided by 2 is going to be an integer. Right? Okay, you go like, okay, I'm not sure this is going to work. Fine. Let's figure this out. So uh, what is 10 divided by 2? Come on, quickly. Use your graphing calculator. Tell me, what is 10 divided by 2? 5. Very good. Okay. So this is 16 plus 5, the whole thing divided by 10, and then take the floor of that. Does it work out for you? 16 plus 5 is 21. 21 divided by 10 is 2.1. The floor of 2.1 is 2. Ah, that seems to work out. What about this one? This becomes 32 plus 5, the whole thing divided by 10. Take the floor of that result. Does it work for you? 32 plus 5 is 37. 37 divided by 10 is 3.7. 3.7's floor is 3. Okay. But tech, you still need floor, and floor is a floating point function. No, I don't need to use floor because we're integer division is automatically taking the floor anyway. So that means I have just found a way to do rounding after a division without using round at all. Is that working? Okay, so let's backtrack a few steps. We started off with division, okay, integer division, and then we realize that when you perform integer division with the um, numerator being close to the denominator, the integer division ends up with a lot of error. Okay, not good. So we want to maximize the numerator as much as possible before we do the division. So if you have a 64-bit processor, it means we want to maximize the numerator to be barely fitting into 64 bits before we perform the division. Okay, so we'll talk about how to maximize it as much as possible before the division. But even if you do that, okay, you still end up with a consistent or single direction bias in the division, in the integer division, because every time you perform an integer division, you are taking the floor of a value. So your error is always going to be positive. The, the, the resulting value is always less than what it is supposed to be. So when you repeat these operations, 
then your bias will grow in one single direction, which means your end result is going to be pretty far off from where it's supposed to be. So instead of flooring, which is intrinsic to integer division, we want to do rounding. But round, unfortunately, is a floating point function, and we don't want to use floating point function. But fortunately, because whatever we need to divide, the denominator is always a, you know, a multiple of two, so we can now use this trick by adding one half of the denominator to the value that you actually want to divide. Then you perform the division, and because it's an integer division, the floor function is automatically applied. So now we have all the basic, bu basic building blocks to talk about how to do the actual conversion. So this is all just math, okay? So now we go back to the slide <clears throat> and continue to talk about how do we perform that division. So this is basically the, what I just talked about here, okay? So we are going to talk about you know, what if the exponent of 10 is less than zero to begin with. What do we do in those cases? Okay, so I can I have to give you an example. Oops, not that one. Back here, there we go. All right, so we are going to use an example of, let's say we have 1.23 times 10 to the power of negative 45. Okay, that's a really, really small value. It's very close to zero, okay? So now we write this as 123 times 10 to the power of what? Negative 47, okay? Because we, we decrease the power of 10 by two by the number of times we have to shift the decimal point. So this is negative 47 times two to the power of zero, okay? I always want to keep remind people that we have another magnitude here. The, the, the objective is we want this negative 47 to increment to zero at some point, and we just end up with whatever this power of two to be and whatever the coefficient will end up to be, okay? So now you go like, hmm, how do we do this? How can we bump the exponent of 10 up by one? In other words, okay, you know, we want to express this as something, okay, I'm going to put a question mark here, times 10 to the power of negative 46, and we are, we can use another value here. We can compensate by the question marks, but the objective is, I want to bump up the exponent of 10 from negative 47 to negative 46. How can we do that? Well, the most, the easiest thing to do is to say, well, if you increase the exponent of 10 by 1, then you have, to sub you have to divide the coefficient by 10. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so that means in the initial approach, we're going to you know, change, oh, okay, why is it not working? Ah. Okay, so that means, you know, whatever this part is, we can say hmm, 123 divided by 10. So if we are not using integer math, do you agree that these two lines are expressing exactly the same value? Yeah. Unfortunately, we are doing integer division. <laughs> so, so this time we have a pretty awful error, okay? It's not really, really bad, but it's kind of bad. Can someone remind me again, how do we minimize the error of a division by 10? Maximize the numerator as much as we can, right? But we cannot just say, oh, let's just multiply the numerator by 10 to the power of 16 or something like that, okay? Because we, I, I don't have a flexibility to compensate for a multiplier that is a power of 10. What if I make that multiplier a power of two? Do you think I have a way to compensate for a multiplier of two? Exact, well, yes, okay. So what we wanna do is to say, hmm, 
we want to minimize the error. So that means you know, I want this 123 to be as large as it can. So I'm just going to say 2 to the power of p. Some power of 2, okay? And the power is 2. And then we divide 10 after the multiplication by the uh, 2 to the power of p. So this way I can now say, yep, we can now increase the power of 10 from negative 47 to negative 46. But at the same time, I can now say, ha, huh, I just have to compensate this to negative p here. Does that make sense to you? Does the math work out for you? I have a multiplication by 2 to the power of p here that's not supposed to be there. That's okay. I can change the power of 2 to negative p to compensate for that. Are we doing okay? And we want 123 times 2 to the power of p to be barely fitting into a 64-bit unsigned integer. So this way we can minimize the error of the division by 10. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have to figure out what that P is supposed to be. Somebody's gonna say, but Tech, this is still an integer division by 10, which means that there's an implicit floor, which means we have a biased error. It is always, the result is always gonna be less than what it is supposed to be. So we have to do rounding. Well, but we already talked about how rounding can be done. We just have to add one half of the denominator to the numerator, then we're going to be we're going to be okay. So just add five before you divide the whole thing by ten. Is that okay? Are we understanding the math? Yep. Hmm? Say that one more time. So adding the 5 before the division by 10 is doing the rounding. It's doing what we are doing here. Because if you add one half of the denominator to the numerator before you divide the entire numerator by the denominator and then take the floor of the entire thing, it accomplishes exactly the same thing as just rounding it. Which means you don't have a bias, you don't have a consistent bias. Sometimes it's greater than what it's supposed to be. Sometimes it's less than what it's supposed to be. So by having that you know, bias to be flipping and flopping, you end up with not a consistent direction of the bias, and then your result is more accurate. Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't see why not. <laughs> as long as, okay, the only restriction is the entire numerator still has to fit within a 64-bit unsigned integer. That's the thing. You can do... Yep. Okay. And so this way, the 2 to the power of p minimizes the error because now you have a huge numerator divided by a really small denominator so the error is minimized the plus five is here because we want to do rounding instead of taking the floor so that we don't end up with a bias problem is that okay all right so what what is the difficulty of doing this it's it looks pretty simple yes Okay, so the five is applied. Okay, if I, I think I understand your question. Does that answer your question? Okay, so I'm only using the implicit operator priority, which means multiplication always has priority over division, I mean addition and subtraction. So kind of keep that in mind, okay? Your operator priority, that's important. Okay, so what is important to do here, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna take row today, so you're, you're all gonna be fine. The biggest thing is, how do we find this P here? 
<clears throat> and remember, I don't want to use log. I don't want to use floating point numbers. So how do I figure, th figure out this P? You, you use a loop. Okay. All you need is a loop here. You basically say, okay, is 123 um, plus 5, is that you know, greater than or equal to the maximum number that you can represent using 64-bit as an unsigned integer? You go like, nope, we, we got room, okay? Then you multiply 123 by 2, and then you do this again. Can we multiply this again? Yep. Can we multiply again? So the answer is going to be yes for a while, and then eventually it will go like, nope, we cannot multiply that one more time. So the question is, how do you know that you can no longer multiply something by 2 again so that it does not exceed the largest value you can represent as a 64-bit unsigned integer. What is that going to look like? Hmm? Overflow the overflow flag is not accessible to you in C or C++. And it would not be the overflow, it would be the carry. Because it is unsigned. So if it's unsigned, the carry flag is what you need to tell whether the result of the addition has already exceeded the largest value that you can represent. Nope, nope. Okay, so if you are going to write a loop here, okay, while blah, 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 okay, you know, and, you know, in the loop here, you just um, will we'll say you know, this is the coefficient. The coefficient is just going to be doubling itself, okay? The question is, how do you know that you cannot double again? The most obvious way is to say, okay, let's not, let's take the plus five out of the consideration, okay? It's, it's complicated things a little bit, so we'll just focus on the multiplication by two. So now you can say, if C times two is less than or equal to the maximum value that you can represent as a 64-bit unsigned integer, then go ahead and multiply. So from a mathematical perspective, this makes perfect sense, right? If I multiply, and it's still, it is still less than or equal to you know, the value, the largest value I can fit in 64-bit number, then go ahead and multiply it by 2. And keep doing this until this condition becomes false, which means you know, C times 2 is greater than the largest value that you can represent as a 64-bit integer. I can tell you right away it's not going to work. Yes? Huh? It's 2 to the power of 64 minus 1, because 0 takes up one spot, right? But I can tell you it's not going to work, because what is the type on this side? It's an integer type, but exactly what kind of integer are we talking about? A 64-bit unsigned integer, right? So we're just going to say this is a u int underscore 64 type, right? What about max? What is the type of max? No, you, you're not supposed to touch double. <laughs> if I hear double one more time, <laughs> you're not supposed to touch double. No, that's worse. <laughs> you cannot use float or double. It's a maximum, what, what is the maximum value? It's the maximum value of a unsigned 64-bit number, which means it is also another u in underscore 64. Okay. Tell me what is the definition of maximum. It means nothing of that type can be greater than that value, right? Which means... Everything of the same type is guaranteed to be less than or equal to the maximum, which means this condition is guaranteed true. Hmm? It would never terminate. 
Okay, I know some of you are not believing this, okay? We are, we are at the end of the class, but I can give you a very short sample program to convince you of this thing here. So give me a second, I will, I'll just write a tiny little program to illustrate it. So we'll go to temp. We do have a lab today, okay? So don't leave yet, otherwise you won't know the access code. So we'll say endless.c. Okay, so I am actually going to show you some code that I'm not supposed to show you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uint underscore uh, 64 underscore t uh, x. So we'll say x is 123 to begin with. And here we say if x times 2 is less than or equal to uint 64 underscore max, which is the macro name for the maximum value here. And what we'll do is we multiply x by 2. And I'm going to use printf here just to you know, print it out. So this is you know, printing out x as a double. Actually, it's going to be an f here. Um, and return 0. Oh, this is not a double. This is a long unsigned integer. So u, l, l, u. Yep, I think it's a l, u. All right, um, I think that should be it. Okay, so if you show this program to a mathematician, the mathematician will say, yep, the loop should exit at some point, okay? Because if you keep doubling something, it's going to be larger than a particular constant on the other side. Except the mathematician does not understand that x times 2, or x itself, is not really an in integer. We are dealing with congruent modulo math here. Eventually, it is a circle. Now, this is a huge circle, okay? But nonetheless, it is still a circle, okay? So, let's go ahead and see what happens when we run this program. gcc-g-o, endless, endless.c. Okay, it doesn't like it because I forgot to do a few things. Hmm? Yeah. But also, I forgot to pound include standard I.O. and missing the semicolon because I've been programming in JavaScript, which does not need that semicolon at the end of a statement. There we go. There we go. Endless. Oh, okay. Uh, why is it printing zero? X is initialized to that. Oh, because eventually it pushed all the digits out. Okay, the program ran a little bit too fast, but let me let me do it in slow motion, okay? That's what happened. Because eventually you shift all the bits out of the 64-bit number. It never exceeded, quote, unquote, never exceeded the value, but you would notice something here, okay? You can see how it doubled, doubled, Hey, that doesn't look like doubling to me, right? It started off with this value. It ended up with this value because the product between that number, between the 1772 blah, 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 and 2 is already exceeding what a 64-bit number can represent. So the whole thing just wrapped around to be something smaller than what you started off with and hence proving the point that this is an endless loop. Eventually, you push all the zeros out, and that's why you only see zeros after a certain point. So this code does not work. The question is, how do you make it work? Because we still want to do a loop like this to keep doubling until we cannot. But since you cannot use this equation the way it has right now, how do you fix the problem? Yes, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yep, good old algebra. If you divide both sides by two, it will still work. If you want to punish yourself, you can certainly use that approach. <laughs> I'm not going to do it that way. <laughs> All right, so I will give you the access code of 
uh, floating point too. I still have to adjust the date and stuff like that, but I'll give you the access code. The access code is just exp for exponent, exp all lowercase. Yes, go ahead. Subtracting one won't be enough. The correct solution is dividing both sides by two because by the time you get to that limit, the value itself is already really big. So you have, if you use the subtraction method, you have to subtract a large amount. Yeah. So you might as well divide it by two because, okay. yeah. Well, it's just easier to divide by Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. This is what? 